get started here. Um, there's a last minute schedule change, so if you are expecting decoupled Drupal, we will be talking somewhat about decoupled Drupal, but we're gonna be talking more about the security of decoupled Drupal. So if you're here for the actual decoupled Drupal talk, I will not be offended if you decide to leave, um, but uh, hopefully you'll stick around and talk security with us. So um, today we're gonna talk about the future of internet security and what does um, the current trends and the um, progressions that we're making in Drupal um, as it goes headless and as it becomes part of a, a greater ecosystem, um, what, does, what challenges does that bring to us? Uh, first off, um, you're probably wondering who is this guy? Uh, my name is Chris Teitzel. I'm the founder and CEO of Locker. We are a secrets distribution network um, handling the, the storage of encryption and API keys, and uh, we have a service for, for Drupal. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at TechNerdTeitzel. Um, go ahead and, and tweet me during the, the talk if you want. Heckle me, do whatever you want. Uh, on on D.O, I'm Seller Door. I just looked it up yesterday. I'm on my uh, seventh year and tenth month. Uh, if you will. Uh, originally got involved with Omega uh, early on in the Drupal 7 days uh, and then have transferred uh, recently to working with a team of developers to uh, completely overhaul the entire encryption um, series of modules. So encrypt and real AES, um, the key module, file encrypt, um, field encrypt, all those good stuff. Um, so if you need to do encryption on Drupal, uh, come talk to me. It's scary to predict the future, um, and I will be the first one to say up here that chances are what I'm talking about uh, may or may not happen, um, but it's stuff that we need to um, at least think about and, uh, um, and, and be familiar with. And so when I think about trying to predict the future, um, back to the future too always comes in. Uh, but I, I always look at it and I say, well, we may not have flying cars yet, um, but they actually did predict a future that is very close to where we are now. Um, this was uh, set in 2015, which in the 80s was so distant in the future. It was doing these weird things like having these glasses that you could wear that had alternate realities in them. Uh, well, we have that today. We don't have the double ties, uh, unfortunately. I think that's a style that we should bring in, but um, the idea that you'd be sitting around the table with a pair of AR goggles on was something so distant that they wanted to uh, to, to put it in there. The other thing that, that was uh, slightly in there, but uh, using your thumbprint as a way to pay for your cab. You know, in the future, that was something crazy. There's no money anymore. You just use your thumbprint and payments occur. Well, we have Apple Pay now and, and Google Pay and, and, or Google Wallet, and, and paying with biometrics is now something we all do on a daily basis. So this is, this is nothing new. Uh, they also predicted that we would be talking through our TVs to people, um, and unfortunately, uh, this is when he's getting fired via video conference, but um, this was just something absolutely crazy. Who would talk to their TV um, and have a video conversation? Yet now, um, I would say most of us in this room do some sort of remote work with our colleagues on a daily basis over video chat. Um, if you're a baseball fan, they predicted that the Cubs would win the World Series one year off, but still not too bad. Um, Self-lacing shoes, we actually do have these now. Um, Nike decided to, to produce some limited series of these. So when we look at our, our current technology, this is stuff that 20 years ago, we were just blowing our minds over saying, this could never happen, this is fanciful, this is Hollywood. Yet now at home, I have an Amazon Echo and I walk in and I say, Alexa, turn on my kitchen lights, and my kitchen lights turn on. And I say, turn up the heat, and my heat turns on. Uh, I don't have the coffee maker, but I could say, Alexa, make me some coffee, and it would make me some coffee. Um, I can see who's at my doorbell from 100 miles away. This is the world that we're living in now, where everything in our life is connected, and everything that we have is constantly pulling data in um, and, and learning about us. Um, and, and it's a, a fun future to be in, but it's also one that, that brings some questions to mind. And so your entire life now is connected. Um, as your digital footprint expands, so does the amount of personal data that you're giving out. Um, you know, you have services now that are watching, what are you, uh, like, how, when do you change the temperature? So they know when you come home from work, right? They know. Um, some of your, your refrigerators, if you're um, getting the new fancy ones, they know when you're out of milk, what you're eating, what you're watching on TV, 
um, your habits of sleeping, if you have sleep trackers under your pillow. There, there are so many things now that we can connect to our lives that personal data is just being collected about us in an ongoing fashion. Um, and while I'm not saying this is entirely bad, I for one absolutely love um, the, the idea of a connected home and a connected future. As developers, it puts an onus on us that we need to be responsible for the data that we're collecting and the data that we are, um, are monitoring. And uh, it is uh, no surprise to anybody that breaches continue to occur. This is kind of a, a size map of the breaches recently. Um, and you will see that uh, there are some very, 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 very big breaches going on. Um, one in particular right there at the top is Equifax, where pretty much every American's social security number, which we unfortunately use to determine our credit, is now leaked out into the, the dark web and, and uh, we have a lot of personal issues uh, coming down the pipeline from that. So with breaches happening daily and with um, all of this data being collected about us, um, there has been some, some economic um, uh, discussion around oil no longer being the most valuable asset in the world. It's data. Uh, if you look at the value of companies that collect data, it's massive. Um, and so the ability to collect, analyze, forecast, and then act upon that is driving the next decade of growth in business. Um, if you look at the, the, the new companies that are coming out that are getting a lot of the, the investments, it's around what? Artificial intelligence, the ability to read large pools of data and then act upon it. And you have to look no further than um, IBM um, recently purchased the Weather Channel. Why would a tech company ever want to purchase the Weather Channel? Well, the Weather Channel has the largest source of weather data. When mixed with Watson, their supercomputer and their AI, they can now put logistics of weather into the algorithms that Watson's using to compute shipping routes and forecasting uh, weather for power grids and cell towers. This is all happening around us and the, the data that, um, that is being collected is, is growing um, all the time. Uh, an article in The Economist, uh, I'll read this for you because it can get a little wordy here, but it says, whether you're going for a run, watching TV, or even just sitting in traffic, virtually every activity you do creates a digital trace. As devices from the watches to cars to, that connect to the internet, the volume of data is increasing. Some estimate that a self-driving car will generate up to 100 gigabytes of data per second Meanwhile, artificial intelligence, such as machine learning, extract more value from that data, and algorithms can predict when a customer is ready to buy, a jet engine needs servicing, or a person is at risk of a disease. Uh, industrial giants such as GE and Siemens now think of themselves as data firms. They're no longer these industrial giants. They are, they are data firms. They are collecting data. They are pooling that data together to then um, forecast and, and analyze and put it into their products. So, Successful companies collect data. Um, whether you think um, the, the data is important at this time, um, collect it. And, and I, as a security professional, um, you, you don't hear that much, but I would say collect data um, and collect the right data and protect it properly. But collecting data now, even if you don't think you have a use for it, is going to be valuable to you in the future so you can run historical data. Um, and then use that data to drive your decisions, to back up your theories and, and lead your company and your product and your team. Uh, no longer do we just have to guess uh, what's going on. We can analyze the data that's coming in from our, our products and our, our services. And, uh, and we, can, we can start using that to our advantage. An example of this that I've recently heard is uh, in the not so distant future, um, we'll have refrigerators um, that can tell what products you're pulling out of the refrigerator. And based on the products that you're pulling out of the refrigerator and your, your Wi-Fi router at home knowing what devices are connected to it, it can go, ah, you pulled out chocolate and wine and it's only you and your spouse at home. It's date night. And so when you go to the couch and you sit down and you turn on Netflix, Netflix instantly comes up with romantic comedies and dramas for date night. It will now start sensing, your house will start sensing what you are doing without you knowing about it and providing that feedback to you in real time. That's amazing. That's products that we should encourage and we should, we should want to build. However, the IoT world is turning into what I call the IOHT, the Internet of Hacked Things. 
And we can see this recently when uh, a massive uh, DDoS attack was orchestrated using DVR and IoT devices, and it took down the entire eastern seaboard of, uh, of the US and, and actually rippled out into Europe and, and elsewhere as well. All internet traffic shut off. Now this is a DDoS attack to the scale that we had never seen before because there were millions upon billions of devices out there that are calling into a service. It's no longer how big of a server farm can you, you spin up. You now have access and, and connected devices everywhere and so we need to start protecting those. Um, cars, uh, a good example was Jeep had a, a vehicle that was shown to have a flaw in the, um, in the BIOS, in the, in the computer, and it was actually programmed to come to a stop while one of the reporters was in it. So a, a hacker in a, in a separate isolated environment was able to use the cellular connection to access the car and, and apply the brakes and, and make the car come to a stop. It's a fairly scary idea if all of a sudden all cars around the world just stop. Um, and so every connection to the web Everything we do creates a new attack surface and a new way for that data to be lost. And, and personal data um, is everywhere, yet a lot of the times when you're building websites or you're building services, you go, ah, it's not that, that much you know, uh, information or it's not that personal, right? Um, so we're gonna do a quick survey. Uh, if everyone can raise your hands real quick. It's the last session of the day, so we need to get a little energy out here. Um, if, who is, uh, if, Keep your hand up if you are from the European Union. All right. Um, who uses an Android phone? Keep your hand up if you use an Android phone. Uh, how many people have a pet at home? All right, we are down to one, two, three, four people in the room by asking three questions that I can find on your Twitter feed. That's pretty simple to, to narrow down and so, what you're seeing now is that identity theft is no longer stealing credit card numbers, it's collecting random data from around the web that all these little data breaches will have, and I can piece together who you are just by seemingly innocent data. And this is used uh, for corporate espionage, we can go in and, and steal data on our competitors and, and get the leg up on them. Political gain, as we've seen recently um, in both the US and the EU. Um, and so what we need to do is A, we need to inform um, our, 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 our customers and our users, what we're collecting from them, and we need to get that consent. And the nice thing now is that that's not just a good thing to do. That used to just be, hey, be a good person and tell somebody what you're gonna collect on them, but now it's the law. Uh, and, and regulations are increasing as more and more of these breaches occur. Um, unfortunately, and until recently, poor security and data breaches have become just the cost of business. It was oh well, we'll get a fine and we'll pay it because we're a rich big company and we can afford to do that and I don't wanna have to go through the process of implementing security because I'll just pay for it. And so there's acronyms for every industry. You have PCI um, dealing with card data, you have HIPAA, FERPA, FISMA over in the US uh, and more importantly uh, for here, you have uh, the GDPR which is going to drive a lot of decisions that, that you make as you start to build your services and your systems uh, going forward. Uh, GDPR um, was enacted two years ago, or a year and a half ago, and it comes into, uh, oh, I have 2017 there, I apologize, 2018. Uh, May 25th, 2018 is when enforcement begins. And so they gave it a, a two-year period for all businesses to come in and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna bring up our systems to, um, to standard. Uh, and we're now seeing, as us developers are um, master procrastinators. We are now just starting to uh, implement some of these systems and everyone's starting to um, feel that this is uh, uh, something that we need to start paying more and more attention to. And this is not just the cookie warning that has been around for, uh, for a while. Now you have to have security by design. As you're building your services, you need to say what data are we collecting on our users and how are we protecting that? And you need to provably have that security by design. Um, you also have uh, data portability and the right to be forgotten. So I should be able to take my data wherever I go because even though the data is in your servers, it's mine, it's my personal data. And then I also have the ability to say, I don't want you to store my data anymore. Well, what happens, and this is a, a, a cloudy point that, that I haven't seen uh, any firm uh, uh, decisions on yet, but what happens in the backups? You can delete it from your, from your real system and your live system, but you now have years worth of backup data that you then have to dig back through and delete that person. Um, are there going to be systems for, for crawling through backups? These are all things that we need to start thinking about. 
Um, and then the protection of personal data, uh, the anonymization, the pseudonymization, pseudonymization uh, and encryption of data is going to be something that you're going to need to do. And so um, whether you think about it or not, like we showed in a couple of, of seemingly innocent questions, we can narrow down the crowd uh, to three people. Uh, you need to start thinking about what is personal, what personal data am I collecting? And, uh, and what do I need to do with this? Do I need to anonymize it so that, uh, so that it's just, uh, I'm, I'm collecting data without the personal piece of it uh, so we can bundle it together and find trends? Or if it is personal, uh, personally identifiable, you need to protect it through some sort of uh, encryption. Uh, and, and this is the scare tactic that everyone will tell you about in, in GDPR and, and the one that uh, is getting the most notoriety. Um, this is for the top, top level, most egregious um, uh, data breaches. Uh, but there is, it is written that you can get up to 4% of your global revenue as the maximum fine. Um, we're finally starting to see uh, incentive for large businesses to no longer write off security as just the cost of business. So what does this mean for us as Drupal? Um, Drupal 8 has kind of this dichotomy. You can either be Drupal as a full stack website and we're just gonna serve the whole thing from Drupal. Um, or you can do Drupal as a headless uh, data source. And, uh, and so those of you who are, are coming in later, whatnot, uh, apologies, this is not the headless Drupal um, discussion you were, you were planning to come to, but we are gonna talk about headless Drupal. Um, and, and more and more now, as we look at how do you use headless Drupal in um, modern applications, uh, it, it's uh, being a centralized data source for the IoT world. It's being used in all of these applications, and so now we have to think about what are we doing with that data that we, we get. Now, uh, OWASP is uh, in the, the final stages of trying to put together a 2017 revised top 10 um, security, um, uh, security topics to, to go through, and these are the top 10 um, uh, incidences. You'll notice that A7 and A10 are both uh, TBA. Those were previously written, and then there were some... Um, as there normally is in the community, some discussion around whether those are actually um, defined well enough, and so they've decided to pull back the official version uh, and revise it again. But if we look down, uh, we have injection, which we all know from Drupal Get In. That was a lot of fun for us all a few years ago. Um, authentication and session management, I would say that Drupal does this fairly well. We, we um, handle our sessions uh, and session tokens well. We have um, user authentication and the um, the hashing that goes on for user passwords is very secure. Um, Cross-site scripting, that's up to all of us to make sure that we aren't just putting code back out into the browsers. Uh, access control, security misconfiguration, um, sensitive information disclosure. Um, the one that was being debated was uh, insufficient attack protection. So now this is talking about uh, the use of firewalls. Um, if you are running a modern web application, you should have some sort of firewall in front of it. Um, there are attacks being attempted constantly against your sites. As you are sitting here now, there are people trying to break into your sites. And I don't say that to scare you, I say that to let you know that, you know, we need to be able to, to put at least a first line in defense. And when we talk about security, we talk about layers of defense, the, the uh, defense um, in-depth approach. And so uh, A7 will eventually turn into um, some sort of, of recommendation around a WAF or, or using a CDN. So, Cloudflare or um, some of the hosting providers now have it included um, in their offering where they provide that web application firewall. And I've um, talked with some of the hosting providers and it's very interesting uh, to be on a call with them and they say, oh, sorry, we gotta go, we have a DDoS happening. Um, and they're just constantly monitoring the system instead of you having to sit on the beeper and, and wait for it. Um, uh, CSRF, cross-site request forgery, um, using components with known vulnerabilities i.e. Equifax, who had open source software that was um, left for two months, uh, Apache Struts, which was left for two months unpatched, and that's what, um, what they got through in. Uh, and then number 10 um, is uh, TBA, but it's discussed to be unprotected APIs, which uh, will be the center part of what we do in a headless Drupal environment. So if you have an API and you start uh, allowing that data to be available via an API, how are you protecting it? Uh, luckily, Drupal does allow for authentication um, into the API and allow you to protect the data uh, that you're serving up in a headless environment. But if you are building APIs that are unprotected or you just turn on um, 
you know, the REST API in, in Drupal 8 and not think about it, you could actually be exposing uh, underlying data that you, um, that you may not know. And so in a headless Drupal environment, this is what we look at uh, now. It's no longer just Drupal as a full stack. Um, this is actually a um, very uh, simplified architecture that we, we drew up for a client. Um, and, and you can see here that they've got uh, MailChimp for email marketing. Um, they've got Salesforce for the CRM and all the sales data that's coming out. All connected into a Drupal 8 site that's then talking with Node. That then talks to React. You have um, the symbol down here in the bottom is uh, Amazon S3. So you've got data and images and such that are being stored in S3 by Drupal that are then being pulled in from React. This is a complex architecture. There is a lot of data moving amongst all of these pieces. And so the, the, the thing you have to think about is how are you protecting each one of these endpoints? And then how are you protecting the data and what data are you sharing amongst them? Because you have to assume that if one of these gets breached, um, the data that's in it um, can also be breached. And so um, from Drupal to MailChimp, you need to protect that connection out to MailChimp because all of a sudden you can have um, your entire marketing email list um, scraped. I was talking to somebody once who had their MailChimp API key stolen and uh, the, the hacker came in and deleted 10,000 users out of their, their, their mailing list. Well, for MailChimp to put those users back in, it's a double opt-in. So they would have to send an email out to everyone saying, hey, do you want to sign up for the email address or the email list that you've already signed up for because we had a breach and your email address is now gone and deleted? That's not something they wanted to do and so they had to end up just losing 10,000 users out of their database. So arguably, uh, Drupal has, uh, of the open source CMS world, I would, I would say that Drupal has the best um, op it is the best option for complex data modeling. I always tell folks, uh, if you have a simple site, uh, a couple of pages, don't use Drupal. You're, you're gonna have a hole in your desk the size of your forehead um, just trying to create a brochure site on Drupal. Um, and that's getting better in D8 um, with the layout stuff that, that Dries was uh, showing. It's, it's getting much, much better. But uh, the way that we model entities in, in starting in Drupal 7 and we started modeling the entities, and then the API uh, first design of, uh, of Drupal 8, and now as we're starting to bring things like media and, and others into core, we're creating an experience in Drupal um, for the authoring experience, not just the consuming experience. Uh, and so Drupal as a data source now is, uh, is a, a very powerful way to model some complex data that you can then expose via your endpoints. And so um, as, you're, as you're building uh, these, uh, these complex um, uh, data models, you need to start thinking about what data are you collecting and, and how are you putting that together? Because now we can easily put together an address field or a phone field or an email field uh, and, then, and then you now have that data on your system. Uh, you, need, you need to protect it and you need to um, manage it properly. In addition to Drupal uh, serving as um, the API source, Drupal itself is connecting out to other APIs all the time. And, and more and more as we move into a microsite uh, and a microservice world, uh, Drupal is just a small, small piece of the, the puzzle. And we've got uh, things like payment gateways, uh, we've got email marketing and SM, um, uh, SMTP, we've got authentication, we have APIs, we have encryption, we have cloud providers, we have shipping. This isn't unusual to have four or five of these APIs on a single site that you would be connecting into. Um, if you're building a headless Drupal site that's, a, that's an e-commerce site, you're gonna have almost all of these in there. Uh, and then now you're, you're passing off um, data out to these providers. Uh, for instance, with payment providers, um, the, the credit card information should never be passing through your servers anymore. Uh, most of the, the modern APIs for, uh, for payment gateways provide you a tokenized way to, to do the payments using JavaScript in the browser. Use that. If you're, if you're um, under PCI, you're now lowering your, your, um, your risk level and your, your uh, amount of self-assessment that you have to do if you can offload it all the way down to the JavaScript layer. Um, for things like the, uh, the SMTP, um, if I'm out there um, sending emails and, and some uh, uh, cloud providers or if you're in a managed hosting environment that shares IPs, um, you need to have some sort of uh, email relay in order to send email out from your site. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, currently the SMTP module stores your password in the database um, and it stores it in the clear. 
I've actually had to recover one of my clients' email address passwords because they forgot it. Uh, and I said, oh, just a second, I got it for you. And I pulled up their database and I scraped through because I knew where to look and I pulled out their, uh, their email info and, and, and password. And he's like, well, how do you have that? And I go, oh, well, the website has it, so I have it. Um, so we need to start thinking about how do, we, uh, how do we protect all of these APIs that we're connecting out to as well. And the reason for this is uh, uh, there's been recent attacks that have, have attacked just that. Um, as we're in this microservice world and everything's connected, uh, one login, a big um, uh, IAM provider in the US, how many people have known with one login or use one login? Just a few, okay. Um, it's, it's more popular in the, in the US enterprise world. Um, they have some of the largest companies in the world um, and it's kind of a single sign-on. So all of the employees in the, in the company log into one login or uh, into the service and then it will authenticate into everything from mail to your CRM and everything else. Well, they had um, a threat, this is a direct quote from their, from their blog, we know that a threat actor used one of our AWS keys to gain access to our AWS platform via an API from an intermediate host with another smaller service provider in the US. Now, they won't give you more details on this, but it's very easy to, to uh, think of a scenario where this is a Drupal site. Um, say you're running a headless Drupal site that's connecting out to your Amazon S3 bucket like we were showing in our example. Uh, if that API key is not provisioned properly, uh, it has master power within uh, AWS, and that's exactly what happened to one login. They use that API key not only to get into their AWS account, but then they started um, spinning up rogue servers that were scraping data out of the, out of the databases. And because the encryption keys were also stored within, uh, within Amazon, and it's all you know, protected, they, they, they were doing things properly. Uh, but because that one API key was stolen, they were able to then scrape the encryption keys and get all of the data out. And so one login had to basically tell all of its customers, we're sorry, you trust us to hold all of your passwords, and now you have to go change all of your passwords. Um, that's something that none of us want to have to do. And so how do, what do we do, right? So I've, I've been talking about the, the threats and the, um, and the concerns that we have, but what do we do? What can we do in order to secure ourselves? Uh, and for me, security starts at the top. Um, you, uh, you want to grow a team mentality uh, of security in this ever-changing environment. Um, and so if you're, if you're a project manager or you're a team lead or a product lead, um, it's up to you to foster um, security and a, and a secure consciousness within your team. This is a, a comic that I always love to use. Um, it starts off here and it says, uh, for uh, he said, for the security, we'd like to hire somebody. And then they say, oh, no, 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 that's not a priority at this time. How many people have heard that? Um, no, it's not a priority at this time. Um, we'll get started first and we'll see about that later. And then later on they say, well, hey, you know, the project is almost done. Maybe we should do that security audit. Nope, nope, nope. We don't have time. We don't have budget. You know, how many people have heard I don't have budget for that? Um, and then they say, well, the site's been online for a little bit and we haven't done any really security testing. I'm getting kind of nervous. And he goes, no, 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 don't worry about it. We'll take care of it later. And then all of a sudden they come in the room freaking out because they've been hacked. Um, this is the mentality that we need to break in our teams. Um, and we need to start back at the first square in that initial discussion around project planning, project budget. We need to start putting security first and putting security into our, our, um, into our best practices. And so when you have uh, a team and, uh, and you're, you're wanting to implement best, best practices, um, don't discount the security concerns of your team members. If somebody has a security concern, listen to it, follow it up, it's worth your time. Uh, even if you're gonna spend five hours on it now, it's gonna save you 500 hours later or $5 million later, right? Um, and then always ask yourself, what if this information gets out? Um, as I said earlier, you know, collect data, collect it, collect it, collect it, and analyze it. Uh, but you should always be thinking about what if the information that I'm collecting gets out? Um, and if it's information that shouldn't get out, if it's information that is potentially damaging if it gets out, then either think about not storing it and, and processing it and, and deleting it or, or just not, not requesting it at all. Um, if, you're, if you're doing a, a website that is uh, for um, e-commerce and you're asking somebody for 
credit card number and birthday and all sorts of stuff, does that, do you really, really need that? Or is that just information that you're collecting because you want to have it? Um, and, and the risk of, of, of holding on to that data is going to be more than, uh, than if it gets out. Use tools and services um, to prevent an attack before it happens. Um, I, I have all of my developers use um, password um, vaults. Uh, we use 1Password. I love 1Password. Um, there's also uh, LastPass, which is web-based. We can talk about that later if you want to talk about that. Um, there are also open source and, um, and more um, localized versions um, if you're a Linux nerd and want to do everything on your own device. Um, but use some sort of password vault. Um, the, the most frustrating thing for me, and, and uh, raise your hand if you've had somebody send you the root password to their uh, server before. Um, I see some nods and some laughs because it happens all the time. Uh, I just had a, a, a client the other day um, send me an email when we were migrating their site and they said, oh, here's the uh, username and password for my DNS registrar. Great. Now I have an extra couple hours of work to do because now I have to go change not only that password, but I then realized he had that password on multiple services and so we now have to go change everything. Um, so use a password vault. Um, I always say the best password is the one that you don't know. Um, I set my one password to be like 40 characters. Um, and if somebody doesn't allow me to have 40 characters, that means their service is not secure. Like I, I absolutely hate it when somebody sits there and says, oh, you have to have between eight and 12 characters and this and this and don't, don't even bother. Um, so use this, get your team to use it, pass um, secrets through that. Uh, one that I don't have listed up here is called Keybase. Um, and it is, uh, think of it as um, encrypted Slack. And um, it, it creates a pair of private, uh, public private keys uh, and it does um, asymmetric encryption uh, via chat. So end-to-end -end encryption, it allows you to um, have a chat, but then it also opens up a Dropbox-like file system on your, um, on your machine where you then have folders for everybody and you can just drop a, a, a file in there and it'll encrypt it and send it to them. Uh, and so we've used that with clients when we have to pass uh, key files or anything like that, we can do it end-to-end -end encrypted through a service like Keybase. Um, highly, highly recommend it. And then, like I mentioned earlier, use a WAF, use a CDN, use something at that frontline protection. Um, like, for instance, with Drupal Get-In, uh, folks that were using a WAF were able to um, you know, we still had to update and we still recommended it, but you could do it a little slower. You didn't have to do it within seconds, otherwise you were gonna be attacked because you could start filtering out those attacks at the firewall. Um, and, and more and more, this is just becoming best practice. You just need a, some sort of WAF or CDN in front of your service, and if you don't, you're, you're putting yourself at, uh, at risk. And if an incident occurs, first thing you do, breathe. Just breathe. It's gonna be okay. This has happened to everybody. It'll happen again. Um, stay calm, and I always say, if, if, you're, if you stay calm, you're gonna avoid making poorer decisions. Um, in, in the height of all the, the calamity around it, you may end up doing something you, you uh, regret. Uh, back up the data, the first thing you need to do is create a backup snapshot. Um, don't, don't think twice about that. Um, a, it's great for a post-mortem, so you can spin up that in, uh, backup in an isolated environment and see exactly what got breached and how. But then also depending on your regulatory environments, um, whether you're in education or, or corporate um, structures, will actually require you, demand you to create a backup um, of the, of the uh, infected site. And then of course, do a postmortem. Um, but as a team leader or, or a supervisor, don't blame. Um, it's, it's, um, it's not worthwhile to pass blame. Uh, instead, sit down, analyze, and learn from the mistake uh, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, I, I heard a, a famous story recently of the, uh, the S3 outage that occurred this last year on, on Amazon and took out um, the whole, uh, basically the whole Eastern data center was going down and everything that relied on S3, which uh, come to find out was pretty much everything in Amazon, um, was crashing around and it was all because one developer uh, ran one command wrong. Um, and just started dropping tables in, in, a, in, a, in a database somewhere and then all of a sudden, it was supposed to clean up one isolated environment and by keying in the wrong command, it ended up just taking out the entire nation's worth of, of S3. So um, stuff like that happens. Don't blame, don't yell, and, and Amazon didn't fire that employee. They, they, they wrote 
this is what they did. It was a mistake, and it's actually our mistake that we even let that happen. Um, so that's the, that's the approach we need to have. Specifically for Drupal, um, the, in Drupal 8, there is the encrypt module. Um, we have completely overhauled it. It's um, lock solid. It's really great. Um, we did break it into a couple of pieces, so it does implement um, frameworks for encryption rather than providing its own out of the box, and we made it that way on purpose. So you have to use it with, uh, in conjunction with a, a module called Real AES, which will um, implement the Diffuse library and do um, uh, AES encryption through there. We've also broken out uh, the key management into the key module. So the key module will manage all of your encryption keys, but it will also uh, now be a central place for you to store all keys, all API keys within the system. Any, any secret that you want to store, you can store in the key module. Um, highly, highly recommend password policy, just like I don't like going to insecure sites. We shouldn't create them ourselves, and so use password policy to, to demand that your users um, have strict passwords. And then some sort of two-factor authentication. There is the, the TFA module, which um, integrates, I believe, with Google Authenticator um, and, and a few others to allow you to tap into other services that provide TFA. Uh, but two-factor authentication, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's um, something you have and something you are. And so um, it, it's a, a way of providing an extra layer of, of security there. I will give a, a shout out for Garter. Um, if you have not yet looked at Garter, um, this is my greatest recommendation. I think that um, what is in here should eventually make its way to core at some point um, because this basically is a distribution that collects together all of the security modules from around Drupal and puts them into one single distribution. Uh, and the beauty of Drupal 8 is you can actually install distributions after you've built the site. So um, you can go put this onto your Drupal 8 site, and, you can, and this works great with all the, uh, with Headless as well. But um, it is, uh, it, it helps Drupal meet the regulatory standards that are, are, are coming out, and it's constantly being updated by a team of security professionals, um, and, and it, it enforces best practice. Um, in Drupal 7, the distribution, for instance, turned off the PHP filter, and it would not allow anybody to turn the PHP filter on because it shouldn't have been turned on in the first place. Um, things like that, that that may be simple to, um, simple to overlook, um, using a distribution like Garter really, uh, really protects you. So definitely go use Garter. Um, and then I've mentioned it a couple of times, um, the price of DevOps. Uh, I don't like doing DevOps, um, and that's because I'm a developer. Um, I'm, a, I'm a business owner. I don't have time to run the servers. I don't want to sit on the beeper. And so this is one of my favorite quotes, and it was kind of an offhand quote from Drew, Drew Gorton over at Pantheon um, at uh, Midcamp uh, last year. But if your website's worth more than $5, pay more than $5 for hosting. Um, I can't say it enough. Like, just don't, don't try to do it yourself. Um, unless that's what you really want to do or, or for some reason have to. But um, there, are, there are plenty of options um, in the Drupal community and elsewhere for managed service providers that will allow you to do that. Um, and, 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 I would, and this is, um, don't do security alone. Um, uh, just because, uh, just because you, you have to build it yourself doesn't mean you're, you're building it alone. Um, open source does not mean that your, your uh, software is less secure, and, and actually the opposite, it's more secure. You have more eyeballs on it, and, and it's being updated more often. Um, but with that comes the caveat of do your updates, um, i.e. Equifax. If you have a, a security vulnerability that's known and it's, it's out there, you need to go and update it. Um, and then, like I, like I said uh, just in the last slide, focus on what you do best. Um, as a team and as a company, and, and I have a big uh, passion of letting the experts do their job. And so if it's what we do, I will hire the expert to do the job. I don't want to be the smartest person on the team um, because then we're doing it all wrong. I want to go find the smartest people, and if it's somebody else, then I'll pay them to do it. So like I said, I don't do DevOps because I don't want to have to maintain my server security. I want to rely on a trusted partner to do that because that's all they're doing. Um, and then continually reevaluate and reevaluate and reevaluate and, and ask yourself, what data are we collecting? Um, was this data something that we didn't think was a big deal um, you know, two months ago, three months ago, two years ago when we first built this? But now, yeah, that, that probably shouldn't be there. Or maybe we should go back and do this. Um, it's never too late um, to, to have a security mindset. And um, just the one thing I want to make sure you guys leave with today is that um, Security doesn't mean you, you, you're not going to have any fun. 
Um, I think the, the ability and the raw capability of having um, Drupal as a headless uh, and, a, and, a, and a data source, a centralized data source in some of these IoT environments. There are, uh, there are even modules now that'll let you create um, Alexa um, integrations or Echo integrations. Uh, so you can start doing um, voice commands. That's great. Um, do that. I, I encourage you guys, go build the future of the web um, and Drupal um, with, um, without concern. Like, don't, don't, let, don't let security be the buzzkill. Um, but at the same time, be, be cognizant of what you're doing and, and think about it um, constantly. And um, yeah, go use Drupal in some really fun applications. And, and I, I'm excited to see what, um, what becomes of, of Drupal 8 and the, and the potential that it has, because it, it, it's really great. So with that, uh, I thank you. Um, the slides, I'll put them up on, on, the, uh, on the website here shortly afterwards. What's that? Yeah, so this was a replacement talk that got added at the last minute, so they're, um, they're re-provisioning all those. So that's why it's hidden, because technically you're not supposed to see it, but, um, which they're doing great security, I guess. Um, but <laughs> I'll, get the, I'll get it online, I'll talk with Amanda, and we'll, we'll make sure that it's online. Um, and I'll make them available, and if you guys uh, have any questions, again, tweet, email, um, find me, and I'd be happy to talk. So. With that, we've got uh, just about 10, 15 minutes here for um, discussion, or you can go grab a coffee and, and get to the, uh, the end. So, thank you. And if you do have a question, they've requested that we use the microphones because all this is being recorded, and so they want to um, be able to record your lovely voice for all of YouTube to hear. Yeah, first of all, thank you. Um, very interesting, more for the first part of your talk. Um, it directly comes up to my mind, uh, the word singularity. The what? The word singularity. Yes. Uh, it, it's becoming more and more popular, so in general saying, uh, we will cross a point where we can't uh, say what's behind that. So um, more or less the last singularity is, for example, mobile web or the internet, uh, the WW. Um, the World Wide Web, so to speak. Yep. But can you imagine any singularities uh, by the example you gave in the beginning of the talk? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that um, th when you talk about the idea of a singularity where, um, where you're, you're kind of reach a point of no return, um, I would say that we've already hit that. Um, I am living proof of it. I have an iPad with an, um, an iPhone and an Apple Watch. I am constantly connected now. And like I said, I walk into my house, um, I'm actually gonna be programming it so that when my Apple Watch connects to the Wi-Fi, my lights will turn on and my heat will turn on and all that type of stuff. We've, we've reached that singularity point. I don't think there's any returning from it. Um, now it's just a matter of what do we do and how do we protect ourselves. When it comes to AI, there's a lot of varying um, opinions out there on, on what AI should do. Um, one of my favorite um, stories around AI is uh, when they first built Watson, um, they told it to read the web. That was its task, just go read the internet. Um, and that is just mind boggling to think of a single application reading the entire web. But then um, when, it was, uh, when they were asking it questions, um, it actually started swearing back at the engineers. Um, and it had read um, Urban Dictionary and not only knew what swear words were, but it used the contextual um, ability to swear back at the, the users. Um, and they, they kind of went back in and said, okay, read the whole web, but that part. Um, and so I, I think we're there. Um, and, I, and I think that it's just a matter of, of we're developers, and, and I grew up, um, I'm a third generation developer um, in IBMer, and so I grew up uh, writing code when I was a kid, my dad would always tell me, computers are only as dumb as we make them, and they're only as smart as we make them too. And so it's up to us to, to be the ones that, that control that. So, yeah, that's a great question. I've actually never had that question come up. <laughs> um, 
what's your opinion about the, the new uh, iPhone X uh, authentication feature, feature and about... The facial recognition? Yes, and about the security implications. And, and what was the second part? Uh, and the security implications of uh, sharing your, uh, uh, your biometrical data. So Apple, I, I actually commend Apple for a lot of their security. Um, they, um, they have what's called the secure enclave in the phone. Um, and it is um, an isolated local, basically, um, encryption, a, a black box for encryption, if you will. Um, they have said, and everything that they have said um, to date sounds very good, is that that data will be um, stored in the secure enclave. So it won't leave that. Um, could they potentially then um, pull up an entire database of every person's face in the entire world? Sure. Um, but as, as, what, as we saw in the US uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, um, which was, yeah, almost two years ago now, um, with the San Bernardino uh, terrorist incident, is that um, they stood up to the FBI and said, no, we're not going to um, weaken our security in order to, uh, to comply with the, the legal orders. Um, so I, 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 at one point, um, am a bit, you know, skeptical of, of having biometrics, but at the same time, it's safer than a password. Um, and I like that. I like that it's being stored in that secure enclave, and, and everything that I've read about and seen about the secure enclave is that it is is a, a kind of a lockbox for data, if you will, um, that's easily erasable, and that's how you actually wipe a phone. Um, is you, you it doesn't actually delete the data on the phone; it just deletes the secure enclave, and you'll never access anything on the phone again. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but it's it's. Um, it's services like that that, um, if weakened or if in the wrong hands, become a very large security concern of you now have everybody's face, you now have everybody's fingerprint, or you have everybody's conversations, right? I, I purposely don't have uh, an Amazon Echo at the office because I don't want um, even the, the ability for um, constant listening and monitoring to go on. So. Um, I'm, I'm totally fine with, with using smart technology. I love it. I'm a nerd, so I, I feed off of that stuff. But I'm also very kind of cognizant of where I'm putting that technology in my life. I've got another question uh, because you uh, just briefly um, touched it. So what's your opinion on uh, last pass, I believe? Yeah, I've, I'm also had a quite a time uh, analyzing every password manager, password vault situation, and um, a colleague of mine uses LastPass, and he's highly confident. I, I definitely see the benefits of it, uh, how to use it. But uh, yeah, to my uh, research, it's inherently not secure, just because you are storing your passwords on their servers you don't have any access to. So, Yeah. Um, this is being recorded, and it'll be distributed, so I probably won't. Um Bad, bad talk anybody because of that um, uh, too much, but I, I, I agree, and that's why I agree. I, I actually personally prefer something that's more hardware-based than, than web-based. Um, there have been security incidents with um, LastPass already. Secure information didn't get leaked, but um, it just shows that there are um, holes that, that can be exposed, um, and that's why I prefer 1Pass. Um, one password is because it's it's um, a local encrypted um, file that is then synced via the cloud to whatever other device you want. Um, but all of the encrypted data is stored locally and it's decrypted locally, um, and it's not sent out. Uh, your keys aren't stored elsewhere, um, and and they they have no way of of backtracking that um, that information back to you. Um, have you ever heard of KeePass? Yes. It's open source. Yep. So KeePass um, is a great. That's what I was like. If they're if you're a Linux nerd and you want to um, you know bake your own, uh, there's KeePass um, Vault by HashiCorp is very good at, at doing that as well. Um, so yeah, there are there are hardware based or or local based solutions, and and that's what I would recommend is is um, whatever you do, keep it local. Um, I just in, inherently um, um, skeptical of the web at times, and so. I read a story on the Twitter a couple of months ago, so it must be true, right? Yeah. But uh, just for the sake of argument, uh, I think there was a story about a case in America where um, I believe a developer was charged with a crime for what was essentially something an employer or 
client had told them what to do. Uh, and so, as you said, you can put something to one side about a developer making a technical mistake. But I was wondering about your opinion about the ethics of a developer being given a job and realizing that they could be doing something that maybe somewhere down the line, the employer doesn't get charged, but the developer does over time. I would say to that employee, give me an email, I'd gladly hire you, because that's an employee that I'd want to have, somebody who has ethics. Um, and to the employer, um, I have words that I probably shouldn't say on a microphone to them. So um, yeah, I, I think that um, at the end of the day, um, we're lucky enough to be in a position where um, the, the job it, pool is abundant for us right now. And so if you ever are put in that position, um, you, should, you should act over on conscience over dollars. Um, I, I don't know if it was the same one um, because I don't know if the person was prosecuted, but um, that's actually the basis of the Ashley Madison hack. Um, was, uh, and that was uh, out of Canada. But um, they were, um, for those of you that don't know, Ashley Madison was a website where they would pair you with other people looking to have um, extramarital affairs. Horrible website, bad premise, but um, what they would do is they would say, oh, you want to delete your account, well, we're still going to have your information, and if you really want us to delete your account, we're going to charge you an extra $30. Um, but they never actually deleted your account. They, they still stored it. Um, and then in addition to that, they had farms of developers creating fake accounts to lure people into the service. Um, and one of the developers got sick and tired of it one day and, and took the credentials and left. Um, and because their, their system was so bad, um, once you got in one door, the whole system was exposed. And so they, they went and systematically leaked everything. Um, am I a proponent of, of hacking in that situation? No. Um, report it to the authorities. but. Um, but it is, it's another case of those, those things where employees are asking people to do unethical things. So in that case, I would say no. Um, the, the, the employee shouldn't do anything on it. Um, and, and I hope with, with GDPR, and hopefully eventually we'll get something like that. Um, fingers crossed that we can do anything in the US, but hopefully we'll be able to do something along those lines in the US. Um, that the idea of uh, privacy by design and security by design makes those conversations um, non-existent anymore because they're regulated to have to happen early on in the process. So, yeah. Third one. Um, have you ever had a look at WeChat um, in China? Because um, I g once got to the attention that since China is quite locked from the rest of the internet, yep. Uh, but is very poor with uh, personal data and um, I once saw a very nice video explaining that um, while I was eating uh, at a, a very restaurant, I paid this very restaurant, a restaurant, I recommended this restaurant, a friend saw this and he paid as well and he had a uh, connection to his deliver boy and so on and none of them ever left the application mm -hmm. of WeChat so they, they were chatting. And this is quite a big security risk, but at the same time, it's also a capital venture. Correct. Um, and so WeChat um, and various other applications, um, WhatsApp and, and the like, um, with end-to-end -end encryption are kind of the bane of um, governments that are wanting to lock down um, privacy and, and security of their, their folks. Um, even here in the EU, there's talk in the UK of um, after Brexit, they want to weaken encryption so that the, the government can, can decrypt anything they want. Um, I, for one, am a proponent of end-to-end -end encryption. I think it's, um, it puts the power into the people's hands that need it. Um, some folks say that uh, it, it empowers too much, and I would say that, again, we've reached that singularity and it's gone. Pandora's box is open. Um, you can't de you can't pull math out of the internet. It's just not going to happen. So um, in that situation, in like a WeChat where everything's happening via the application, sure, it's, it's, a, it's a huge risk. But um, in, a, in an environment like, it's, um, like it is behind um, the Great Firewall, um, that might be what's necessary in order to circumvent some of the, the data privacy. Because when you enter those countries, you have to assume that everything you do is being watched, monitored, and, and recorded. And so, um, yeah, so end-to-end -end encryption, and, and for those of you that are building applications, especially with Drupal and such, um, there was a recent um, blog post on it. I'm not, um, I still have to, to dive into more of the specifics on it, um, but there are some of the, the beginning stages of a end-to-end uh, -end encryption around Drupal as well. 
where you can actually encrypt from the browser out, um, store it encrypted, and then come back to somebody else um, and use kind of Drupal as a as an encrypted relay. So um, there are there are ways to do that in which provide security through obscurity, and there are ways to do it with um, actual um, good end-to-end -end encryption. But a lot of the times, um, asymmetric encryption like that is is difficult to get the average consumer to get their mind around end-to-end -end encryption. So you kind of have to do it for them behind the scenes. All right, with that, we'll, uh, we'll let you guys go. The, the end session is happening over there. Once they do open up the, the slides online, I'll, uh, I'll post a tweet out and, and let you guys all know, and thanks again for coming. Hi.